Cruise ships carry people. It's their whole reason for being. They feature unbelievably large, impressive galleys creating monstrous amounts of food. For example, the Queen Mary 2 will produce somewhere in the vicinity of 16,000 meals per day. Passengers will eat up to about 12 tons of beef, seafood and chicken, and two tons of potatoes in a single week. But all that food has got to go somewhere. And, as we all know, thanks to a helpful children's book by the same name, everyone poops. But at sea, where does all the sewage actually end up? Today, there's a popular misconception that cruise ships simply dump sewage overboard. But is that just a myth with no basis in reality? Does it go straight into the ocean, or is it stored on board? Is there another method? I'll let you on in a little secret. The answer has nothing to do with the poop deck, but we'll talk about that a little later on. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to explore and answer the question, what does happen to all that sewage aboard cruise ships? Every year, cruise ships are getting larger and larger. Today, the world's biggest ship, the Icon of the Seas, accommodates up to 7,600 passengers and 2,300 crew members per voyage. Each year, over 30 million passengers travel on cruise ships worldwide. That's a lot of bums on seats, if you know what I mean. And the logistical challenge of managing all of that waste produced during a cruise is immense. Each passenger generates a substantial amount of waste daily. In fact, an average cruise ship with 3,000 passengers and crew combined creates close to 21,000 gallons, that's nearly 80,000 litres of sewage, per day. But because of strict regulations, it means that efficient and environmentally responsible sewage management systems are an absolute must on board. Now this does create some serious challenges, but ones which clever engineering can account for. Back in Titanic's day, toileting at sea had gone through a series of evolutions. By the time Titanic set to sea, she featured hundreds of flushing toilets and urinals. In fact, many passengers from rural backgrounds had never even seen a flushing toilet before and were used to just using holes in the ground. So early on, stewards on board ships like Olympic had a hard time explaining their use to steerage passengers who were actually just prone to simply finding a darkened corner in a corridor at night to do their business. Even before then, toileting had been simpler still. In the days of sailing, crew and passengers would use the heads, so named because their original location had been way forward at the ship's very front in the chains at the bow. Simple holes were cut into planking, it meant they could do their business right over the side. By the turn of the 20th century, flushing toilets weren't just a novelty, but a standard at sea. But despite the technological revolution they provided, the end result was the same as the simple heads of sailing ships. Sinks, showers and toilets drained or flushed through plumbing, which then ejected the contents right over the side of the ship through dozens of small engineering outlets cut into the side plating at the waterline. We have a nice romantic image of these ships like Titanic from back then, but the truth was they were sailing along, leaving a trail of waste behind as they went. Even worse, once docked in port, the overside discharge wouldn't stop, so swimming or fishing near large docks back then was an obvious no-no. The disposal of waste overboard on something as big as the ocean seems like a simple solution, but it does create some problems. Sewage pollution, particularly when untreated, poses serious health risks to both marine and human life. Marine life exposed to harmful pathogens and toxic chemicals can lead to infections, reproductive issues, and weakened immune systems in animals. Sewage in the ocean can also fuel algae blooms, in which algae grows out of control in a body of water, causing damage to marine life. For humans, exposure to contaminated water can also result in diseases such as cholera, gastroenteritis, particularly affecting those who consume tainted seafood or engage in water-related activities. Coastal communities are also at risk thanks to marine pollution, with long-term exposure increasing the risk of chronic health conditions. This wasn't so big an issue when sailing ships could carry one, maybe 200 passengers, but now, with ships carrying 5,000 or more, it obviously presents problems. The evolution of sewage handling on ships runs hand in hand with mainland waste management, and it actually wasn't until the late 20th century that real action and regulations were put into place to deal with it. The International Maritime Organization introduced the MARPOL Convention in 1973 to establish global standards for sewage treatment that limit pollutant levels and designate restricted discharge zones. So importantly, they added Annex 4 in 2003, which regulates sewage discharge from ships. The other annexes include managing oil, noxious and harmful substances and packaging, sewage, garbage, and air pollutants. The MARPOL Convention set a new course for environmental safety on the water. Under the convention, every ship 100 gross tons and over, and every ship certified to carry more than 15 people requires a garbage management plan. 
So with strict regulations in place, technology has quickly advanced and modern day cruise ships now have sophisticated sewage management systems that effectively handle and treat the onboard sewage. Now these systems are designed not only to meet, but also often exceed the thorough international regulations outlined in the MARPOL convention. These rules are enforced around the world through the flag and port states, that's the nation of the ships that are local or visiting. So flag states are responsible for ensuring that ships flying their flag comply with MARPOL requirements, while port states have the authority to inspect visiting ships and ensure that they are also in compliance with MARPOL regulations. Whew, now with that interesting background context and information out of the way, how actually does it work physically on board the cruise ships? The sewage treatment process begins at collection points, where black water, which is from toilets and medical facilities, and grey water from sinks, showers, laundries and kitchens are divided into separate holding tanks within the ship's hull. Now both black water and grey water pass through filtration systems to remove any solids and particles. The black water then goes through a biological treatment using aerobic bacteria to break down organic matter and reduce the pathogens. Grey water doesn't go through this process because the special bacteria that do all the biological work can be harmed and killed by chemicals found in soaps and shampoos. Both the grey and black water then meet again in the final sterilisation tank, which uses ultraviolet light, the most environmentally friendly sterilisation option, compared to things like chlorine or other chemicals. The treated water is then subjected to rigorous testing and analysis for bacterial content to make sure it complies for discharge. So if any microorganisms are still present, then the water goes through the whole treatment cycle again. If the water actually passes testing, then it can be discharged over the side and into the ocean. Surprisingly, the treated water discharged in the ocean from ships is often cleaner than the surrounding seawater that it enters. Marpol also has rules regarding when and where a ship can actually discharge its waste. The general rule is that a ship needs to be further than at least 12 nautical miles from the nearest point of land. So the ship also needs to be in motion at a minimum speed of 4 knots, and the treated water to be discharged from its holding tank has to come out at a moderate rate. There are some designated bodies of water which are deemed special areas under MARPOL, and stricter rules apply. Places like Alaska, the Baltic, the Mediterranean seas, they all fall under these special rules. Cruise ships have more than just sewage and grey water to consider when it comes to tackling waste management on board. They also need to consider the huge amount of solid waste that are created during the voyage. Things like food scraps, plastic bags, packaging, they all have their own processes. The regulations require ships to limit disposal at sea, instead managing waste through onboard storage, sorting and then proper disposal at port facilities. Bilge and ballast water also need to be maintained. They have their own special treatment systems and plans on board where oil and pathogens are separated, removed from the water before being treated and approved for discharge into the ocean. Now, despite all the technological advancements, waste management still remains a very contentious issue in the cruise industry. Environmental organizations and advocacy groups continue to fight for stricter enforcement of regulations and greater transparency when reporting incidents. Now, regardless of the strict rules still in place, the challenge of waste management on the high seas is a process that costs time and money. There have been some famous cases of big cruise companies being caught red-handed attempting to work around the system. Cruise operators like Carnival and Royal Caribbean have both faced major legal and financial repercussions for this. More recently in 2016, Princess Cruises paid the largest ever criminal penalty for the illegal dumping of waste. They agreed to an eye-watering plea deal and were fined over 50 million US dollars. But what about cases where the waste management system on board the ship has actually failed and everything goes haywire? Well, look no further than the infamous voyage of the Carnival Triumph, more affectionately dubbed the Poop Cruise. In February 2013, the Triumph departed from Galveston, Texas for a four-day cruise in the Gulf of Mexico. On February the 10th, a fire erupted in the ship's engine room, which disabled the ship's propulsion and knocked out the electrical systems, impacting air conditioning and, of course, toilets. For several days, the Carnival Triumph drifted without power and remained stranded until tugboats arrived to tow it in the nearest port. But as the days passed, conditions on board deteriorated rapidly. Passengers had to endure unbearable heat without air conditioning in the tropical climate, there was limited food and water supplies, but then, worst of all, many of the ship's toilet facilities began to overflow and seep throughout the ship. As if things couldn't get any worse, passengers were then asked to use red plastic hazardous waste bags to relieve themselves of solid waste and use their showers for, um, number ones. This caused oppressive discomfort and frustration for everybody involved, much of it which was documented at the time via passenger smartphones. After delivering a trip never to be forgotten, the cruise line eventually organised efforts to deliver supplies, implementing sanitation measures and evacuating passengers once the ship was towed to shore. 
To Carnival's credit, the passengers were eventually offered full refunds and other kinds of reimbursements. Individual lawsuits were also filed by passengers, leading to legal settlements and compensation for their uh, memorable trip. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this video, there is one thing that we need to sort out, and that's the origins of the infamous poop deck. Well, despite what some popular opinion may think, the poop in the term poop deck actually originates from the French word for the stern of a ship, or la poupe. Now, this French word is derived from the Latin word pupus, which is one of three constellations that form the Greek constellation Argo Narvis, representing the ship Jason and the Argonauts sailed in Greek mythology. Now, after all that, the word evolved over time and became the English word referring to the very stern deck of a ship, and of course, the butt of many jokes. So there you have it, behind the scenes on every cruise ship voyage, there is an intricate system in place to help keep our oceans clean. From primitive discharge practices to sophisticated treatment technologies, the journey has been marked by challenges, innovations, and will continue to improve. After all, at the end of the day, everybody's goal is to be able to enjoy these beautiful oceans that we get to call a part of our magnificent home. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. I'll see you again next time.